Precision medicine, is it hype or help, fact or fiction? Welcome to Precision Insight. This is a podcast series where the most influential thought leaders and innovators in healthcare sit with me to chat about the latest technologies and tools of precision medicine. What is coming up in the near future? If you want to know more about this incredibly fast moving field of research and development, stay tuned. Hello everyone, I'm your host Martin Dawes. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Genexus Healthcare Systems and we're really excited to welcome our guest for today's episode, Melissa Badosky. Melissa is a Clinical Associate Professor and Clinical Pharmacist in HIV Telemedicine for the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Pharmacy. Dr. Badosky manages patients with HIV in the Illinois Department of Corrections through telemedicine services as well as in the outpatient setting and through transitions in care. She completed her PGY-1 pharmacy practice and PGY-2 pharmacotherapy residences at the University of Maryland Medical Center and the University of Maryland College of Pharmacy in Baltimore, Maryland. Her specialties and research interests include HIV and infectious diseases. Dr. Bodowski is the founding chair of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy's HIV Practice and Research Network. Before we dive into your background, I'd like to start with a fun question. If you had to explain to a seven-year-old child what comprehensive medication management is, how would you describe it? That's an excellent question. So I think about when you go to a doctor's office and maybe you have a sore throat and maybe you get a prescription for medicine and bring it to the pharmacy to pick it up. Well, some people decide not to actually take their medicine or may not understand how to take it. Or think if you take the medicine and maybe it gives you a tummy ache or when you drink milk at the same time as taking the medicine, it may cause it not to work. So I think of it as one of my roles in being a clinical pharmacist in providing comprehensive medication management or CMM is to work with a patient to see what prevents them from taking every medicine as prescribed. So basically, how are they following directions and making them feel better and hopefully live longer? I don't look at just one of the medications or one of the medicines, but every medicine a patient is taking, whether it's behind the counter of a pharmacy or over the counter in something as simple as Tylenol or ibuprofen. In addition, I work as a teammate of the person who actually prescribed that medicine. I write down my recommendation in every person's chart and involve the patient in creating and sharing the plan. I form a relationship with the patient, meaning I will likely see them more than once so I can help them to meet their goals for getting rid of their sore throat or making sure that that bellyache goes away. I can also act on behalf of the person who prescribed that medicine as long as I have directions in place to do so I can actually change the medicines as well. But most importantly, I'm able to make the patient understand how to take the medicine and make sure that they understand that and that they take it every day. And this is an ongoing process. So I repeat this cycle every time I meet with the patient. Wow, that's a pretty impressive review of the comprehensive medication management. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on that interprofessional bit there and your current work at University of Illinois. Can you give us a quick overview of what it's actually like working in an interprofessional care team and who's involved and how it works in practice? Certainly. So in our interprofessional care team, I'm working with my team to provide telemedicine care to inmates, and that's through 26 prisons and drug treatment centers in the state of Illinois for individuals living with HIV. We were one of the first programs to use telemedicine to reach this vulnerable population. Each person on our team has a specific role and expertise. So for instance, the physician is the expert in diagnosing and treating a patient. We also have a nurse who is with the patient at our far site, so in one of the prisons, and they make sure that the prescriber's medication orders and laboratory testing recommendations are carried out, as well as providing updates to a patient's current medications while ultimately helping the prescriber or the physician to perform a remote physical exam. So I know you're thinking, how can we perform that physical exam? But it is limited, so we can hear heart and lung sounds through the use of a 
telephonic stethoscope. We can look if a patient is talking about a rash by using an exam camera. So that's one way that we're able to do that. So my expertise being the clinical pharmacist on the team is to ensure that the patient is receiving the optimal medication or therapy while reducing their risk for side effects or drug interactions. So I also make sure that the patient isn't taking unnecessary or duplicate medications and the patient understands what their medications are and how to take them. So it's not just limited to their HIV medication, it's all of their medications, why they're taking these different medications and alerting them of any major side effects or potential drug interactions. My role is a little bit different from that pharmacist you see in the community setting, so who's dispensing your medicine from behind the counter, because I actually don't do any dispensing. Instead, I just make sure that the patient is educated on how and why they're taking it and that each medication is appropriate. And finally, in our uh, care team, our interprofessional care team, we have a case manager slash uh, social worker and they actually help to assist in scheduling medical follow-up upon release from prison and actually start the process for medical and prescription insurance coverage. Do you discuss cases as a team before and or maybe after you, you've met with a patient virtually? Absolutely. So the nice thing is we have our list prepared for the day. If there's any major issue that we've you know, seen before we're starting clinic. We all are in the same building, and so we'll talk about it beforehand. But the neat thing for us is that we're all on the same screen at the same time. So think about the Brady Bunch. Although there's only four uh, quadrants within our screen, uh, we are all on the same call at the same time in real time with the physician, the pharmacist, that's myself, our case manager, as well as the nurse and the patient. So we're all in that same virtual space. And again, if there's any follow-up that we have to do after clinic, we absolutely make sure we do that. But I think one of the nicest parts of this is that we're all in the same space and we're able to see a patient for follow-up in an average amount of time of maybe 15 minutes. And some of our new patients or those who are coming back to us in as little as 30 minutes. Wow. Okay. And and do you think that that actually gives you more interprofessional communication and say if you're a pharmacist working out of a normal pharmacy? Oh, absolutely. I get to see every patient. And I think about this when I do my outpatient visits. So I'm not seeing every person. It's virtually impossible for me to do so because I have four providers or five providers and one of me. And so I can only review the patient's medications and take a quick look and basically allocate my resources to be able to see the people who have the most pressing issues or the most medication issues in that regard. So in this setting, I'm able to see every single patient at every single facility. Wow. We know that pharmacists are crucial in effective delivery of patient-centered care. Do you see a change in the role of pharmacists since you graduated or over the last few years? Oh, absolutely. I think I'm not going to date myself into when I graduated, but I think it's we're seeing more of focus on pharmacists being able to provide one-on-one time. So uh, they may be able to dig a little bit deeper than maybe a provider who has to meet all these various metrics is able to do. So we're able to make sure that we've looked at the patient's medication records from even an external area. So maybe where they fill their medicines, or if there's any questions in the therapy that they're receiving, we're able to call a pharmacy. But also we're able to make sure that we're providing that patient-focused care. When I sometimes go to my own provider, I feel like I'm rushed, but I know that they are having 20-minute intervals until they get to see the next patient, where I'm able to spend a little bit more time. So I think that's one of the major changes from what it used to be. You think of your regular pharmacist, and I still think to this day, if I explain what I do to my family, they still think that I work at a regular retail chain. And I'm like, no, I actually don't dispense any medications, and they just look at me like, what do you mean you're a pharmacist? And I tell them I haven't touched drugs in years. But I think clinical pharmacists are able to provide that individualized care and set individual goals for patients. And again, with the patient involved, it's that shared decision-making process. So I get a lot more time to be able to do that. And I think that's kind of the biggest change. You think of pharmacists, you know, like I said, in the dispensing role, you think of them maybe rounding 
in the medical or inpatient settings or outpatient in like anticoagulation. So um, managing mm-hmm. warfarin and stuff like that. But I think even pairing it with that telehealth component, I still get to see that patient one-on-one and have a little bit more time to uh, dig deeper into some of their medication-taking behaviors or issues. Yeah. Is there anything in uh, any conditions that you think that telehealth doesn't work so well for? I think for me, it's going to be if you need to really have that extensive physical exam And so that's something that as a pharmacist, I wouldn't necessarily be doing. But I think if you have somebody who's complaining of certain pains and you need to check their range of motion with maybe their shoulder, they have shoulder pain or back pain, anything like that, that might be one of the limitations. But I'm not saying that you couldn't follow up with a patient doing it. I think you need to have that first visit with them, seeing them face to face to at least have a benchmark or a baseline. And then I think following up, you can see if it's improved. I mean, with the time of the pandemic, you even see physical therapists being able to perform telehealth and they're largely very hands-on. So I think there's various opportunities, but I think some of them we haven't explored yet. And I think that's the nice thing about telehealth is that it's definitely an evolving and rapidly evolving field. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think COVID has just resulted in an explosion of telehealth from hospital, clinics, primary care, you name it. I think you mentioned physiotherapists. I think a lot of other groups as well are using it now. And do you see any challenges with some of the technology? Do you think that me seeing you or you seeing me using a telehealth platform gives enough to be able to perform or you've given a few limitations like physical exam but is it good enough quality for you to think that okay this is as good as me sitting in front of uh, martin in in uh, a room together yes absolutely so i think of my history with it and i've been doing this now for 10 years we've had our program and it's hard to believe it's been that long but i was a little apprehensive at first I was thinking that I might miss that patient interaction, but as long as you have a face-to-face so that you're able to have video capabilities and technologies, I'm still able to pick up on their nonverbal cues. I can see when they're uncomfortable. I can see when they're upset by something or something that I've said in terms of maybe they're not meeting their goals of therapy. I'm absolutely able to see that. So I think that's really important. That I don't feel like I've missed anything from. What can be a a source of frustration is maybe the internet connection. Some of the rural populations, that could be a little bit harder. If a call keeps dropping, that can be very frustrating for a patient. But, you know, when I think of our telehealth, I'm thinking of that telemedicine being face-to-face and in real time. So I don't feel like I've lost anything from that. I think you've just dropped a little bombshell in there that maybe our listeners aren't too familiar with, which is this phrase, nonverbal cue. And would you like to give some examples of how that might appear in either a face-to-face or a a video consultation? What do you actually mean by nonverbal cue? So that's a great question. So I have a few examples. And, you know, you think of yourself when you're uncomfortable and you start fidgeting back and forth in your chair, that would probably tell me that a patient's uncomfortable. Maybe uncomfortable with using telehealth because they're concerned. Maybe there's not complete privacy, but what our telehealth is, we're able to do it all in real time. And so nothing is recorded. So that's one of my things is to say, are you okay? Is there anything that's bothering you? So that's one of my nonverbal cues. Other thing is, I, I think back to one of my patients, And uh, they were rocking back and forth. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe they're upset. Maybe they're, you know, nervous about something. And then when we said the reason that we're having the visit, they immediately changed their demeanor. So they thought that they were um, here to see a psychiatric provider for mental health um, issues and concerns. And they thought that if they rocked back and forth, they were going to get more medicine or be able to uh, do something different with their medicine. So that was some of the nonverbal cues that I was able to pick up. When we said that, hey, we're here to talk about your virus, they just stopped immediately and went on as if nothing was different. But then, you know, you're also able to see a patient if they have a question. So, you know, I stop and allow time for them to ask questions. I make sure that they're open-ended. 
meaning I'm not asking yes or no questions. So I'm definitely able to pick up on that just as if we were sitting in the same room. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a whole science behind the nonverbal cues and, and our responses to those as, as healthcare professionals. And it's good to hear that you and I think a lot of others are able to use that element of nonverbal cue even within the telehealth experience. So that's great to hear. Going back to the medication management, you mentioned you were looking at uh, renal function at the beginning. What sort of resources are you looking at when you're doing you know, an evaluation of someone who might be on three retrovirals and some you know, four or five other drugs or two or three other drugs? How do you approach that? Right. So what I will first do is ask either the nurse or the patient has kind of in our setting, what we're able to ask is what their um, medication list is. And we actually have the patient ask them, are, is this what you're taking? And sometimes what the nurse says and what the patient says are differing. So uh, we start there first. And the other part is, is the patient actually taking what's on that medication list? And so in order for me to assess medication adherence, meaning that they're taking their medications as prescribed, I ask them, in the last month, have you missed any doses or wh- how many doses have you missed of your medications in the last month? And usually they're going to tell me on the first try, no. I don't know why it's that second or third time I ask them. So I'll ask them a follow-up. How about in the last two weeks or how about in the last week, how many medication doses have you missed? On that second or third try, when I ask them again, they're more forthcoming because I think the first time they think about, well, maybe I'm not telling the truth and maybe I need to tell the truth so that they can really assess me as a patient and am I meeting my goals? So that's really the first thing. And so if for some reason they're not taking their medications as prescribed, I will ask them, is there something that they don't make you feel right? Are you having side effects? And I'll list a few side effects. Or is there something personal that's going on? Or when you take these medications, do you just not feel good? Or all these other questions. So I really have to dig deep and try to figure out what's going on with the patient. I can't just look at one of their medicines. I have to look at their whole list. And then I have to see, because we do practice in a subspecialty model, meaning that I take care or I manage their HIV or infectious diseases, and somebody might manage their high blood pressure and somebody else might manage their diabetes, I have to make sure that I see the whole picture because Mm -hmm. there are certain medications that can interact and cause unwanted side effects. So I think about a patient I had just the other day who was complaining of an upset stomach and they thought maybe it was due to their HIV medication. But then we realized that one of the providers had gone up on their dose of uh, an antidepressant medication. And so it was definitely linked to that. And so we educated the patient about that. And we encouraged the nurse and the patient to bring that up to their provider. So I think it's really important to see any like roadblocks or barriers uh, to taking their medication. The other part being, you know, we've had patients who have told me, come every Saturday for religious reasons, I'm not taking any of my medications. And Mm -hmm. while I might not want to hear that, I have to respect that and think about how I can adapt my plan to make sure that they are still meeting their goals. I mean, it is very complex when you're talking about all the potential drug-drug interactions, liver, renal, et cetera. It is a complex issue. And if you're dealing with specialist drugs, the retrovirals, and, and then you're trying to match them with other chronic disease managements, it, it Do you have software? Do you have charts or electronic processes that help you capture all that information? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So at this time, I rely on my training of what I've done and my years of residency and learning on the job. But we do have the software within our system to alert us of drug-drug interactions. And so we don't at this point have any software, but I definitely can see the role of taking that human error out of that. And so definitely a software would be helpful. And, you know, maybe for me, I know what those drug-drug interactions are, but what I see all too often are other prescribers 
who don't pay attention to that or maybe aren't aware of these drug-drug interactions. And so it takes it until it comes to me before I'm able to address these issues. So I maybe see a patient today and I might not follow up with them for three to four months. And that means next week, another prescriber could put them on a medication that interacts with the medication that we use. And I might not know about it for a few months. So it'd be really helpful for everyone to be on the same page and have that software available to them. In terms of uh, CMM, what do you think is going to be the most exciting development over, say, the next two to three years? What's on the horizon there? So I think in CMM, specifically for telehealth, I don't think there's a lot of data out there at this point. Mm -hmm. In comprehensive medication management, there is some data that is available, but when we're looking at it um, specifically through telehealth, there's really nothing out there. So I think that will be one of the major areas for excitement that's going to be coming out. And I think always we're looking on how we can evolve. How can we make sure that we optimize the medication management so that the patient actually meets their therapeutic goals and improves their quality of life that they're living? I think really improving that quality of life is going to be the major part of it. I think of it at the core, this is why I became a clinical pharmacist, is to improve the lives of others. But I think just you know, continuing to use this process is really an important thing, and not maybe only for me, but even providers to start to use this process. Um, And even if there is the technology available to do so, I think that would be really the biggest thing on the horizon. Yes. I mean, going back to that statement you made about your family being a little surprised that you didn't dispense pills, I guess the response there is, yeah, but I'm still improving their quality of life. And hearing you speak as a pharmacist with that main aim, I think speaks very highly about where the profession is moving to. And I'm not saying that pharmacists never did that. I'm just saying that the impression that the public had was that that it wasn't necessarily their main focus. So I think it's really good to hear from you that pharmacists have this as a main objective in terms of the quality of life of their patients. In terms of then seeing the interprofessional collaborations going forward, just returning to that a little bit and and hearing how important that was to you. Do you see that expanding across other areas of care, either in Illinois or further afield? Absolutely. I think this is something that we're seeing what interprofessional care teams can do. And I think we're getting more data that's out there that's just showing that if you're working together, and you're communicating with each other, it's just a win-win for the patient. And I think that's really the important part. I think um, everybody's starting to put kind of egos aside and really working for the total part and total care for the patient. So I just see that expanding even further. I mean, there's so many projects that we're doing in our own backyard where we're trying to start our students working with other healthcare professions. And so we're trying to start them as soon as they come into pharmacy school and working with medicine and nursing and physical therapy. That's just to name a few. So I think we're just on the brink of it just becoming the standard of care moving forward. Fantastic. And a final question. I don't think we are post-pandemic yet, but hopefully we'll be getting there earlier rather than later. What do you think is going to be different in healthcare following the pandemic? I think so much is going to change um, because of this pandemic. If there's one good thing that's come out of it, I mean, not a lot of good things have come out of it, but it's really that expansion of telehealth. Uh, Like I said, I've been doing this for 10 years and I've seen numerous barriers to wanting to implement telehealth. I think for a lot of uh, the reasons we've discussed previously, but I think it's just Coverage from insurance companies is going to be expanded. I know it's been way more flexible now, and I'm not saying that the same flexibility will still be there moving forward, but I think it's just going to allow more patients to engage in telehealth. Maybe the patient wasn't necessarily comfortable in participating in a telehealth visit, but now that they've had a visit or two under their belts, I think that they'll be more willing to adapt to the technology 
I think it's also allowed us to reach more patients than we would have ordinarily been able to. And this is through regular primary care or even subspecialty care. And I think it's allowed a lot more flexibility on both the provider as well as the patient's behalf. Yeah, so I think that the access to care through telehealth is definitely something that's changing rapidly. What do you think will stay the same following the pandemic? I think for me, what will stay the same is having a lot more telehealth visits. I think of my own clinic in my outpatient setting, and initially we were not doing telehealth clinics prior to the pandemic, but now we are. And now we're only bringing patients in if we need to have a physical exam or a certain laboratory follow-up. So I think maybe that will change just a little bit, but in terms of uh, staying the same, I think a lot of this moving forward will stay the same. And my hopes is that what will also stay the same is the coverage and reimbursement for telehealth visits will also stay the same. Excellent. Dr. Vodowski, this has been extremely helpful in understanding what you are doing. And I think for listeners hearing how you've approached the problem of chronic disease management, HIV, but also other diseases in institutions using telehealth, using the medication management process, I think it's obviously an example to all of us and how you can do that and the interdisciplinary model as well. I mean, All those things together is not a simple thing to put together and to work with. So kudos to you for doing that. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me.